Well, hello and welcome to the CNBC Africa special. We're at the uh, sixth Council for Science and Industrial Research Conference. My name is uh, Fifi Peters. Well, it's unquestionable how technology is changing and improving our everyday lives. I mean, from the phones that we use uh, to the tablets that we're now writing on, and even cars that will uh, very soon be driving themselves. But the question is not just about how this technology and the big data AI and the internet of things can improve our ordinary lives but what impact they can have on the broader economy the question is how to uh, uh, inject much needed vigor into the economy so that it can grow and also so that we can alleviate some of our social ills uh, being high unemployment being poverty and inequality thus it is therefore fitting that the theme of this year's CSIR conference is uh, ideas that work for industrial development and it is on this note that I'd like to introduce my panelists right now because we're going to be brainstorming some of the ideas that can work and we're going to be finding solutions also to alleviate some of the problems that we are experiencing right now. So I'm going to start from my end right there. That is Mr. Imran Patel. Uh, he is the Deputy Director General of Socioeconomic Innovation Partnerships at the Department of Science and Technology of South Africa. Uh, sitting next to him is Ms. Janine Uzel, who is the Head of Women in Technology at General Electric. <coughs> Then it's uh, Philippa Rothseth, who is the executive director of the Manufacturing Circle. There's Mr. Sol Levin, who is, is the executive director of Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies. And uh, sitting right next to me is uh, Dr. Tulani Tlamini, who is the CEO of the Council uh, for Science and Industrial Research. Remember, you can follow us on uh, social media, and we really encourage you to engage with us on uh, social media. The hashtag is CSIRCONF2017. I'm going to repeat that. That is C. C S I R C O N F 2017 and our Twitter handle is at C S I R also on Facebook at C S I R South Africa as well as Instagram at C S I R South Africa too. Well, let's kick off the discussion. We are here to brainstorm ideas that work for industrial development. And I'd like to ask everyone here to raise an idea that they think could work in the role that science and technology and innovation can help to improve some of the ills in this economy. And Imran, I'd like to speak or ask you first from a policy perspective. Now, I know your department is doing a lot to drive other government departments to innovate and to become more digital. But if you have an idea right now in which science and technology and innovation can improve the work that you're doing, what would it be? I think the key is to see how we effectively use existing and our own IP and own technologies in South Africa to improve the competitiveness of existing sectors. We have to realize that our existing sectors, whether it's agriculture, certain areas in manufacturing, chemicals, etc., are all global enterprises, they're competing globally. And the new technologies, if we don't keep up with them, uh, we're going to be left behind. In order to grow uh, jobs, to grow economic development, we need to start with existing sectors and hopefully during the discussion we'll also have an opportunity to talk about some other areas which is opportunities for creating entirely new industries out of science and technology. But a key area that I think we're not necessarily uh, doing enough on is to look at how we modernize some of our key industrial sectors that's contributing to growth and what does it mean in the context of high unemployment. Uh, and Janine, I come to you now because you work for a multinational company. In fact, you work, have worked across many uh, geographies across the world. So what can South Africa use from the experience that you've seen in other countries in, in terms of improving its, 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 its role or the role that science, innovation and technology can help for the economy? So my answer will be very innovative. <laughs> we just need to put the women to work. <laughs> and uh, we have the ideas, um, we have the passion, uh, we have the creativity, and uh, we have the knowledge. And um, I think it's just time to take a bigger bet on women in technology. 
I don't know how big an idea that is, but we're sitting right at the table. Right. And um, it's time for us to no longer be overlooked, but um, really tap into some of the ideas. And then specifically, uh, on a serious note, to South Africa. Mm -hmm. I really believe, uh, as someone who has lived many years in Africa and worked here, in the localization of solutions. So there are a lot of solutions um, in Africa for Africa that just really need um, to be invested in and we need to just shine the light on them so that they can, they can really uh, manifest and solve the problems that are local to uh, what we're dealing with here. All right, thank you so much, uh, Janine. And Philippa, you work in the manufacturing sector, not the prettiest uh, sector of the economy right now your idea that could alleviate some of the pressures that the business and the broader economy are experiencing right now. Technology and innovation is fundamental in terms of improving the competitiveness of manufacturing, which is the engine, at the, the growth engine for our economy. So it's something that we cannot ignore and we've got to utilize to our fullest potential. There are some practical examples across the board because the one thing that we can't afford in this country is that um, innovation and technology ends up in um, resulting in job loss. So we need to see how technology and innovation can assist us in um, augmenting our skills base, augmenting our manufacturing processes as, re as opposed to replacing peoples with robots, which I think is one of the high level and general fears, but I think that's an issue that we can unpack and um, actually identify the opportunities. A very practical example that I like to cite is for example in the um, uh, footwear manufacturing sector where a process of prototyping for example um, the, the model that needs to then be used to manufacture the shoe is very laborious time-consuming and um, you know if one can uh, deal with that um, using innovative technologies what it allows to do is unlock <coughs> a huge potential for um, more uh, real-time manufacturing production and still the labor-intensive portions of that in terms of actually manufacturing the the shoes mm. still assist and in, in addition um, the potentials for mass customization for example can be enhanced. Can be enhanced. Thanks so much. And uh, Sol, I mean you're very passionate about Industry 4.0 uh, or the smart uh, future that we're entering but your idea? Um, I think a lot of our stuff needs to be looking at the regular and ongoing innovations that need to take place in industry. Um, it's, it's nice to have the, the sexy stuff and the new industries which are important but there's a lot of just unexciting work that needs to happen to help ordinary firms become more innovative, more technology orientated. Um, we still have firms in South Africa using technologies from 60 years ago. Um, they don't need to, but there needs to be a process of collaborating between um, the science institutions, the universities, um, government with incentive structures and industry just to modernize and to become more innovative and to use the latest technologies to become more competitive. Um, it's very difficult to be competitive when you're using old technology and the countries that you're competing with are using the latest technology. So I think there's a lot of scope to go into um, just ordinary day-to-day -day kind of unsexy, unexciting, but just fixing problems and getting into new technologies that way. All right, and Tulani, we'll finish off with you, our hosts uh, for today. I mean, the CSIR, your mandate is essentially to use, you know, your science, uh, tech, innovation uh, to foster the general improvement of the, uh, the economy and citizens as a whole. But your idea that can help you uh, improve on your mandate there? I think one of the things that we need to engage with very seriously is ensuring that we get the maximum return from the investments that we are making as a country in innovation. I don't think that we are at the point where we can say we are receiving the kind of dividend that we expected to receive from the investment that we are making as a country. I think part of the problem, in my view, is a misalignment between what the economy and industry requires to be more competitive in the innovation that we are investing in. I think there needs to be a better alignment, but it requires also better coordination in terms of the innovation agenda of the country. That we take a whole government approach with regard to how we approach innovation within South Africa. I think that will go a long way in terms of ensuring that we can maximize the return on investment from the, from the investment that we are making on innovation. 
All right, so maximizing return on investment key there. But Imran, I'm going to bring it back to you because you spoke about uh, improving the competitiveness of existing uh, sectors. So which sectors right now are standing out uh, for you that it could be easy to implement? Because I want us to talk about ideas, find solutions that we can implement as in uh, today. I mean, these can't be things that we're talking about implementing in 20 whenever. So the existing sectors that are ripe for that improvement, what are they? How do you go about doing it? In fact, it's happening in all, all sectors. I mean, I wouldn't want to lift any sector that we've identified as a priority sector in, in the Industrial Policy Action Plan or where, where we have existing capabilities needs to happen. The I issue is not which sectors to choose, but more what kind of mechanisms do you put in place for those sectors to innovate. So as an example, one of the, the kind of uh, successful initiatives that we have at the moment is something called sector innovation funds. These are at small scale at the moment, but we're trying to, to, to scale them up. And the intention here is to work with industry associations in particular sectors or subsectors of the economy. So we have a, a partnership, say, with the wine industry. We have a partnership with the citrus industry, with the other agricultural industries. We try to have uh, engagements with, with uh, a boat building as an example. But the thing about this fund is that it's a public-private partnership. Uh, government invests together with industry in industry-relevant problems, but industry defines what is it they require and put out calls for, for, for projects that allow them to improve their competitiveness. So I'll give you a simple, simple example, and this is where I would align with what uh, Sol is talking about. We have a big um, uh, footprint for our agricultural products into the European Union market, uh, or even in the US. I mean, one example was avocados recently, I'm told. When the way we, we, we harvest our avocados, pack it, transport it, and get it to a growing market, the US uh, with crush avocados is a growing market for avocados, uh, and we can get it into there. The problem with one of our varieties is it gets to market and it's too soft. Right. So the science that was required is how do you optimize everything from the, the picking to the packaging to the transport so that when it gets to a consumer in, in the US, it's at the stage where there's still two or three days before it gets ripe. So it's right. those kinds of things. We've done this with other projects where you needed to look at the packaging of, 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 of uh, uh, products, etc. So I would say that all of those key sectors that we've identified, both high, medium tech, whether it's leather, whether it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, um, clothing or textiles, etc., need to have a kind of a, a combined innovation plan that is shared by government and industry and for us to jointly invest in that project. One big area, and let me leave it, that, that we have huge opportunities on is mining. Uh, we have uh, significant reserves that we can unblock and the only way we're going to get to some of our reserves, and Sol and, and, and Tulani know about this here, is to get into more mechanized mining over a longer period of time. Right? Mm -hmm. and, but the issue there, though, in, in order to balance improving the competitiveness of one sector while creating new spaces for industrial development, is to not just focus on mining, but to develop a strategy that looks at what uh, mining equipment is required to go more deeper, mm -hmm. robotics, etc. But at the same time, how can we become equipment manufacturers? And right. that's the kind of uh, link that, that can only happen if you have a, a fair level of coordination between industry and government around each individual sector in the economy. So that's, that's a, a long answer. I, I say government shouldn't be choosing sectors. We right. should be creating uh, the environment, an enabling environment for, for the instruments, for the partnerships, for the initiatives, for us to get the value from our research and development as best as possible for all of the sectors that can give us what we need from a societal perspective, which is uh, increased incomes, uh, employment, etc. All right. So a holistic uh, view yes. there on all sectors, ensuring that no one gets left behind. Jeanine, you spoke <coughs> about putting more women to work. Very, very interesting uh, because recently we had a, a discussion around the ICT sector with uh, 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 one of the leading players there in the sector. And the stats that actually emerged was the fact that 20 percent, that is the figure or oh, that is the level of female participation in the entire ICT sector, 20 percent. 
and that is versus a global average of 56%. Now we also know that globally they're also struggling with issues of gender parity, so their 56% is actually not that much better, but I think it puts the light on just how bad we are. Putting women to work, how do we go about doing this in the area of science and technology? Well, the first thing we need to ensure is that we're keeping the pipeline full. And so it really starts with getting girls into STEM, making sure that um, the generations that are coming up through school are interested in studying the sciences. And there can be such a stigma to that. Something happens um, between the ages of like seven and 10 with girls where science is fun for a while and then uh, it becomes kind of nerdy or I don't want, you know, I don't want people to know that I like it. And so we lose them. And, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure of why that is, but I just know that it's important um, at that point to ensure that we're uh, introducing them to various programs, camps, events and efforts that help them understand the importance of it. Um, and so building the pipeline is really important. That's, that's you know, the first thing. And that goes all the way through the university and ensuring that um, not only are they entering university to study in the sciences, but that they actually graduate with those same degrees. Because we do find that Many times, uh, will st women will start in the STEM fields and then maybe two years in, they're changing their majors. Um, so then it's graduating them. And then the same thing rolls over into the workforce. Right. We find that they come into the workforce, they're working in uh, STEM-related roles, and then a few years in, uh, they're transitioning. So it's great that we may be retaining women in our various organizations or companies, but they're leaving the technical roles. And so organizations, um, whether you're private sector or, or, or what have you, um, I think it's about ensuring that, one, we're creating a path to growth for women in technology, um, that they're able to find uh, the roles that are exciting and that are engaging and that give them really um, great challenges and things to work on. I think it's impo important to look at your culture in your environment. Um, does your culture really ensure that um, a woman in all stages in her life can be accepted in the workforce? And that's through marriage and children and, and higher education. And so the flexibility of a workforce, uh, ensuring um, you know competitive benefits and a lifestyle where a woman can um, be able to ensure that she can work well. I'll give an example. Um, we have um, instituted a program. This is in the United States. Um, again, I used to work in Africa. I now currently work in the States again. And we instituted a, a program uh, in partnership with a carrier company uh, in the States. Um, it's it's um, um, a major carrier company, but for women uh, who are traveling in their role, uh, who are also breastfeeding, they're able to ship their milk back home while they're on the road. Um, and um, I think that's a, a game changer yeah. for a lot of women um, because they're able to be out on, uh, on travel for work, they're able to still uh, feel like they're meeting a, a personal connection and commitment to their child. And, um, and it's a part of their benefit package. So you and can breastfeed and then send your milk And then you the package road. it. Right. And then it's shipped um, and it's, it, it's uh, received at home and it's fresh and it's still usable. And you know, as, as a woman that does not have a child, um, I have been talking to several of my colleagues about what that means. I, I believe that it's important, but what does it actually mean to someone who is a mom? And just listening to their stories and the impact um, that it has on them and even just the, the personal effect that it has, maybe a, a sense of guilt or the way it lifts um, a weight that they might feel um, right. in that separation. It's really important. So um, instituting can I, can I this. Can just jump in there and yeah, actually please. ask some of the women here with their children? I mean, would that innovation be welcomed here in South Africa? Right? Can we? Can I stop? Can we? We're just going to get a mic to you. We're just going to get a mic to you. I want to hear your story. <laughs> yeah, this is great. 
Hi, my name is Nicolene Meeting, and yes, that is very important to us. I'm a breastfeeding mum at the moment. Um, my little one is four and a half months old, and I'm expressing at work. They organised me a, a small um, bar fridge, so I can store my, my milk in the fridge, and in the afternoons I can take it back home. Right. And I know my, my child is getting the best. Yeah. And here's the, the, the add-on to that, just as a, a, a scientist myself. So one of our, um, one of our women scientists, um, and her husband is also a scientist, she was away for work, she pumped, she sent it, she tested the milk before she sent it home, and then she shipped it home, and her husband did uh, a test right. uh, on the temperature, <laughs> the wholeness of the milk. So this is what happens when you put women in, in science in a room, right? So she's like, not only was just the opportunity to do that great, but the milk still had the same purification values and you know it was still great for the baby right. and everything like that. And I thought that was, um, was a neat thing to actually have her being a scientist want to do this. Now this is a benefit that we provide for any of our women, but I think it's just, it's, it's these, um, these small moves mm. and, and shifts in culture it's that are gonna have a massive change. And, and notice that so far you, none of my answers allow me, that. Sir, we'll come back to that. Can you just allow me to interject there because I actually Please. want to hear what Philippa has to okay. say. I mean, uh, your idea, you emphasize the importance that science and technology being fundamental, quoting your words to the manufacturing industry, concerns being how to stem job losses. How would you go about doing that? What we need to do is understand um, the various benefits at a detailed level that um, an advanced manufacturing <coughs> environment could create. And um, I agree with my colleague on this side of the table that um, we, it doesn't need to be um, sort of incredibly crazy in terms of ideas and there's there's very simple interventions that can be done and need to be understood by business, by subsector. And I'm also very pleased to hear that from the policy making point of view, there's also the, um, the understanding that we need to create an enabling environment from a policy making point of view, but not necessarily from a policy a uh, policy maker point of view, pick winners. So create this enabling environment, be consistent and, and um, cohesive in terms of how those various um, mechanisms are implemented and then um, give, a good, give a good framework for industry within, it, it, within which it can then work. So, so um, and fundamental to that would be a constant um, investment by industry in research and development innovation and also upgrading current equipment. Um, other very basic examples that we've seen is perhaps identifying um, in a business where are the dull, dangerous, dirty um, uh, sort of activities that could be replaced by mechanization and so increasing um, manufacturing production and output but not losing jobs. Right. An example there would be for example um, a tooling um, uh, workshop where um, you know it's a dangerous environment so door has to be closed if somebody has to go in and pick a tool open the door close the door um, it, it makes the production process more laborious whereas if a robot did that um, it, it would mean that the rest of the production line worked quick more efficiently and would allow for more labor so those kind of examples are the sort of things that we need to identify at a very um, practical level in order to see how we can compete and augment what we're doing without losing jobs. Skills, huge example there as well, and training, where um, one could have some, some sort of technical innovation if you're looking at a welding process, for example. Right. Not all welding can be done by robots, but if you've got a welding process and you can have some sort of um, training intervention and mechanism to make sure that, you know, um, 
uh, each weld that is done is then sort of assessed and inputted via a, a virtual um, uh, system. One could get more efficient in those, those sort of ways. So there's a lot that can be done. All right, so that's very positive and encouraging because there's always a fear when you speak about increased automation and in science and AI that it automatically means job losses. But you're talking about a scenario where it's a transitioning of jobs into new roles. So you touched on that collaboration between a business and a government being crucial. How do you go about doing that? And especially in the economic environment that we're currently in, everybody is pretty bleak in terms of confidence. We've seen this from business, we've seen it from consumers as well. How do we strengthen that collaboration in such difficult times? I think collaboration requires people engaging on a regular basis. So it's not just a a once-off meeting that people have with an institution. It's around identifying ongoing structures that can engage on a regular basis and also practical projects where industry says, look, we have this problem, can we collaborate to find a solution? Or government saying we have technical expertise, can we send people in who understand the scientific issues? Companies often don't have scientists on site because it's expensive and drawing on for a particular intervention, a, a team that can be able to provide that kind of support can make the difference between being competitive or not competitive mm -hmm. or fixing a production process. Um, what, what we have seen is that you, know, you can bring in the latest technologies. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to use those technologies as effectively as the country where you've bought the technologies or the licensing from. Mm -hmm. So things like production layout, how you manage your waste, um, dealing with um, stoppages in production are all things where you can find practical areas of collaboration. And we do have a long history of collaboration. Right. I think what's happened is the, the, the tensions in our society, and we, we can't paper over them, they exist, mm. have meant that we, we're not collaborating as we should. To grow economically and to achieve the levels of industrialization that we need, you have to have that ongoing and regular and systematic collaboration between individuals, between companies and institutions, and not captured collaboration. Right, you um, said it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but something called embedded autonomy, where you know, you, you're working with each other, you, mm -hmm. you're finding ways of engaging, but you, government still has its way of working, the company still does what it's doing, but you, you're collaborating in a meaningful way that's going to yield um, productive outcomes. Um, just while I'm talking, just something that you, you've mentioned. Um, I think in South Africa, it's, it's not even about getting the breast milk home. It's right. around creches in the first place. So if you want to get more women to work, I mean, we, early childhood development, which was raised in the session earlier, and creches to allow women the space to even, <coughs> you know, leave the home in the mm. first place are critical in our environment mm. and we, we don't have enough of that and it's something that you know there's been a lot of talk and effort put in, in in certain areas but it's something that really does need to be expanded on um, there's lots of education benefits on that and it is an inhibitor if you're worried about what happens to my child when I'm going off to work or look for work then you're facing very real problems so I understand maybe in the American context that's a key issue but for us we, we also need to look at a few steps back and say what, what is the first blockage? Um, mm -hmm. And am I able to leave my child in a safe place when I have to go um, off to work? Mm -hmm. And where your child is stimulated intellectually and not just with someone who's going to make sure that they don't crash into things. Right, right. And you know, I was um, actually at a briefing where they were talk describing the future workplace. And I know the likes of Google and Facebook and all that are really doing that, whereby you've actually got the crashes and the gyms and all kind of recreational areas in the workplace. So it's easy to navigate between uh, uh, the two uh, respective fields. Hopefully South Africa is not too far behind on that field. But Tulani, you spoke about the fact that we are not getting the maximum return on our investment. So if you had a magic wand that would ensure that we could, how would you go about doing that? I think part of the issue that we need to address, in my view, is focus. Right. Um, I take the, 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 the comment by the colleague that the government should not be in a position to, to choose. But I think there's a need for us to prioritize as a country. I think countries that find ourselves themselves in a similar situation than uh, as ours in the past. If you look at South Korea, for instance, 
they prioritized you know, consumer electronics, the automotive industry, and those are the areas that they then drove in terms of innovation. I think there's a need for us to do that also as a country. And that needs to be informed by an understanding of areas where we have a competitive advantage in South Africa. I think one could look at, for instance, mining and minerals, agriculture, chemicals, and ICT is areas of potential focus for the country to drive a very focused innovation agenda around those particular areas. Because I think at the end of the day, strategy is about choices. And if you cannot make choices and prioritize, I don't think that we can be able to say we'll derive the kind of impact that we want to make from innovation. You know what, we're going to take a very quick break at this stage and pick up on uh, some of the salient points that have just been raised when we return. Well, hello and welcome back to the CNBC Africa special where we are documenting the sixth Council for Science and Industrial Research Conference. Now, before we went to the break, we were brainstorming some ideas in which science, technology, and innovation could play a greater role in the economy. We did touch on some of the challenges and also spoke to possible solutions to those challenges. It's at this point where I'd actually like to pick off with my panelists who could continue to join me here on a stage. Imran, I'm coming back to you. So the issue of the very tight budget that we have and as an economy. I mean, earlier this week, we had the finance minister admit that the country might not actually reach its 1.3% growth potential, that uh, government borrowing would be very hard uh, to come by. The problem is, I mean, technology um, is expensive. So how do we ensure that we're keeping up with the pace of change, of technological advancement? in this environment whereby funds are tight? Well, a couple of, I mean, the, the whole, enter, the first thing to acknowledge is that the research, development, science, technology, whatever you call it, environment, is not something that is short term. You have to take a long term outlook, whether it's business or industry or, 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 or government as an investor, we need to take a long term, a long term outlook on this. Now. Within the long term outlook though, even within existing resources, there are significant opportunities to innovate, to do things differently. You know? Because there's always this, this balance, they say most, most uh, companies when you face a crisis, uh, you need to begin to seek out and look for new solutions. I mean, let me give an example, we have, uh, um, and, and it will link to, to, to creating an enabling environment for women to work as an example. Uh, P women spend lots of time going to public hospitals as an example. Uh, uh, f uh, uh, someone was telling me today that you know sometimes people spend a whole day there. That's productive time lost Definitely. in the economy. But by cleverly using existing technologies, it's not, not trying to invest, rethinking the processes, you can improve some of those things. And it's some, some of it are very effective, not necessarily huge investments that allow this to happen. For example, using uh, uh, mobile technologies more effectively. So when you have these challenges, I think that's the time when, in fact, uh, there's the greatest opportunity to innovate, even in a tight fiscal const uh, fiscal environment. You need to identify what is it that needs to be done. From uh, from the side of government, uh, we would continue investing in long-term research projects, etc. I think the one that we are concerned about is is in industry where industry needs to take, like I said, that long-term approach as well in terms of its own competitiveness. Huh? Um, and I think the money is, is less important once there's a, a commitment to building a strong, inclusive society, a modern uh, society, etc. I think we can find those means uh, by cooperating better, by clubbing our resources effectively. Like I'm saying, the mining one is a good example. It's a case now where the mining industry and government and others are co-investing in the way that you talked about. So we need to be innovative, not only in terms of the technology, but we need to be innovative in terms of how we finance things and how do we use our scarce resources. And what is it that we prioritize now that will then give us the kind of growth that we require, uh, free up, uh, like I said, people from drudgery so that they can contribute meaningfully to the economy, etc. Those for me are all huge opportunities for, for, for new solutions 
based on technology and based on other innovations. Right, so let's actually hear from industry now. Philippa, I'd like to ask uh, you. Now, I know that the Manufacturing Circle is uh, doing some work together with the Gauteng uh, Premier in the Val to resuscitate a project there in the Val. So there's some form of partnership going on with government. But what would it take to get more projects like that where industry and uh, the government are working together? Basically, just um, a lot of hard work and a lot of commitment and a lot of energy and a lot of belief in that we are doing the right thing. Manufacturing is absolutely critical to uh, job rich growth in this economy. And um, the Val Triangle Rejuvenation Project is exactly that. It's an initial pilot project to have a look at what can be done in a collaborative effort between industry and government to revive that sector and that area so that we don't end up with the next rust belt. So we've got two um, primary um, uh, value chains in that area, steel and, and chemicals, and it's, an, um, it's, it's, it's a process of identifying how can industry collaborate across those value chains to become more competitive to identify new markets, to export more, grow demand, and in so doing create jobs, and um, how can that be supported by and enabled by um, policy makers. And it's a really a bilateral growth pact, if one wanted to refer to it in that way. Um, but what about policy certainty? Because Philippa, you've been quite vocal about policy certainty mm. on the various platforms where you've communicated. So you said hard work, you said, you know, interest, education, but what about policy certainty? Are the existing policies right now governing and manufacturing enabling for the businesses to do more work with the government? We, we do have, our, our policy environment is, is um, quite advanced and, and pretty sophisticated. Okay. Where we do have a lot of challenge, and it's, it's the fundamental of industrial policy, is the alignment and collaboration between the different areas. So, um, and, and just as an in industry, I think in government as well, we do generally operate in a society of silos, which is not very helpful when one needs to deal with industrial policy, manufacturing development, which requires collaboration across value chains. And certainly um, the, the consistency in terms of policy implementation is critical because otherwise um, one loses, uh, let's say, um, confidence and, and, and trust in a system. Right, and Tulani, what about beneficiation in terms of helping government who are working uh, with a very tight budget and we know that R&R doesn't come cheap, but would beneficiation help to address some of these issues? Because there you'd be exempt from the volatility of a constantly weakening exchange rate. You could create new industries, jobs and also much needed revenue for government. No, no, certainly. I think beneficiation is perhaps one of the areas that we need to focus on in terms of ensuring that we can take maximum advantage of the natural resource that we have as a country. Again, building on the competitive advantage that we have in terms of access to the resource. Uh, I mean, the CSR, for instance, is working closely with the Department of Science and Technology, looking at the beneficiation of titanium into, yes. into metal which can then be supplied into the high-tech sector, for instance, aerospace and so on and so forth. I think that is one of the avenues or the ways in which we are trying to address this. But certainly there's more that needs to be done in terms of ensuring that we can fully maximize, I think, the value from the natural resource that we have. But there's a challenge that we face. I think uh, my colleague from DST talked about this. I mean, if you look at the mining sector, the mining sector has been under a lot of pressure in the recent past, and maybe even before that. Um, if you look at investment in R&D by, by the mining sector, that has declined significantly over the years. I mean, the CSR used to have a very, a very large um, R&D program in the mining sector, which is supported by the private sector. But that investment was taken away to the point where, um, I think a couple of years ago, in fact, we were looking at closing our mining research activities until recently, with the, with the advent of mining Pakisa, in the creation of the mining hub that we've come back into, into the mining sector. So there's a need for private sector to invest in terms of innovation that would enable us to beneficiate the resources that we have as a country. 
So you're also very passionate about the youth and you did touch on that as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the great thing about being a youth is that, you know, we interact with the city. I'm still officially a youth by <laughs> NC standards, by the way. <laughs> so we interact with this technology all the time, adapting it to these uh, new processes, relatively easy for us. The not so great thing about our youth is that our maths and our science marks are dismal, one of the lowest, in fact, in the world. So how do we fix that such that, you know, the youth are playing a greater role in this space, but such that the very same youth, I know you don't want to compare, but sometimes you need to look at what the best in the world are doing. The very same youth can take on the kids in China, in Hong Kong, in the US. So I think there's a lot of scope for diffusion of technologies. So things that there are already existing technologies, you might have 3D printing or CNCs or um, programming, depending on the skill set that the youth have. And how do we diffuse those technologies and make them accessible for the youth? So it's, it's not stuff that's going to be you know, an entire manufacturing processing plant, right. but to, to expose young people to being able to make a plastic bottle or a toy or a, a part or even I've seen um, 3D printers that are making crafts that can then be sold um, you know at the local market so there's a lot of scope for um, exposing them and for getting them into entry-level type businesses using the latest technologies and doing it at a very cost competitive way because um, you're using the latest technologies and you're you're giving them <coughs> excuse me an opportunity to get access to that but also it, you don't necessarily need maths and science to operate those technologies okay. maybe design skills are what you need so sure the guys who are doing the programming are going to need a particular skill set but there's a lot of scope for people with other skill sets um, creativity is quite important when you're looking at a design or making something interesting for someone. Um, those kind of things start becoming important as well. So I don't think we've, we've missed the boat because we, we don't have the, the skills today. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be investing massively in the next generation that's coming through um, and making sure that they do have those STEM skills. Um, but we, we can still diffuse the technologies, make it available, and find ways of doing it in affordable, you know, make getting a basic um, 3D printer can cost 15,000 Rand. Um, it doesn't mean, it's not, you know, unaffordable um, for that kind of technology to be made available to a school um, or to young people in a university environment. <coughs> and I think just also touching on the youth, wh one of the issues that, that came through in my presentation, but also what um, Sizwe was talking about, around how do we ensure that the TVET colleges are training people with the right youth with the right type of skills. So it's something that um, the manufacturing sector is deeply passionate about, that people exiting those colleges are not coming out with the right skill set that they can use when they're getting into the workplace. So then either they have to be retrained or they don't get hired at all, which means we, we're sending youth to a few years of training, they're coming out of it with the expectation of something and they can't even use those skill sets. So how do we then say, what are the latest and best technologies, either directly from manufacturing sector or you know, given, made available from science um, institutions so that the youth can be trained on the latest and best and get accredited in the kind of courses that industry require or will enable them to go into their own um, business environment to start a micro enterprise or small business. Right, which is uh, definitely needed. I mean, if you look at the unemployment rate of our youth, also one of the highest in the world. But at this stage, I'd actually like to open up uh, questions uh, to the floor. If you've got any questions that you'd like to answer the procedure, please could you just uh, stand up, tell us who you are, and uh, raise a question, and we'll actually bring a mic to you. There's a gentleman right there in the front. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Temela Hill. I'm from CSIR at Nano. Uh, my question is based on what you're just talking about, the youth and unemplo unemployment. It's coming from the premise that uh, big companies shed jobs. Small companies and startups create jobs, especially the innovation-based enterprises. And my question is that what is then the CSIR strategy in that regard with startups and 
uh, innovation-based enterprises. But I think a follow-up to that is that if we talk especially with innovation-based enterprises, I think IP is critical. And now in that space, we understand that IP helps to generate revenue, but it can also inform the industrial architecture. In this regard, for example, IP, do you mean intellectual property? Intellectual property, right. yeah. Okay. So, so it helps to generate revenue, but also, if you open it up, it can also inform industrial architecture. A, a, an example in this is that if the DNA was patented, we might not have biotech industry. So what is the strategy then in that space? Any other questions in the room? There's a lady here. Mike, will come to you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Patience Mtunzi Gufa. I work at the CSIR National Laser Center. I have a question for Janine. I think my question was sparked by what you said regarding um, putting females in tech. Um, it's, it's actually not a question in a sense, but maybe it's one of the things that as a female scientist I think we are facing is the um, ability to keep females in tech. Um, the issues of remuneration are a big challenge for female scientists. The National Development Plan is communicating a certain number of females that needs to be put um, or that needs to be increased in South Africa, especially at PhD level. But there's a problem of actually housing these females in terms of places of employment. Another issue is once the females have been employed, then there's challenges of maybe retrenchment of female PhDs. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking about this because Janine put it up, but any member of the panel can, of course, um, help us in understanding this. My second issue is on the localization of solutions that you, Janine, also put up. Um, I would like to ask you, how do you think this can be effectively done? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Okay. All right, at this stage, I think probably let's take those uh, questions. And then if anyone else has questions, just I uh, will come to you in uh, the second round. But uh, Tulani, uh, the first one goes to you from your very own. He would <laughs> like to know the CSIR strategy to deal with this scenario of unemployment where big businesses are cutting jobs and SMMEs are seen as those who have to do the hiring and also the IP. No, certainly I think it's a very relevant question. Um, in fact, when we talk about our focus on industrial development, it's precisely because we realize the role that we need to play in terms of stimulating economic growth and contributing towards job creation. Not to say that we have not done anything in this regard in the past. I think if you look at the previous year, for instance, just taking the biotech sector alone, I think the CSIR was instrumental in the establishment of 23 companies, creating over 177 jobs just in the past year in the biotech sector. I think the issue for us is to be able to do this at scale and to derive the kind of impact that we want to achieve as a CSIR. And hence, I think our focus on industrial development will ensure that I think we can tap into the broader capacity that exists within the organization and direct it in a manner that will ensure that we can have a higher level of impact in terms of job creation and the establishment of SMMEs. But one must be careful not to write off the role of big business, because big business often creates the market for small and medium enterprises. So one mustn't think that our focus on SMMEs is now at the exclusion of ensuring that our big business also remains competitive. Thank you. And uh, Janine, uh, you were highlighted the issue there of uh, retaining females in the tech and also remuneration. We know that all over the world this is an issue whereby uh, the pay gap between women and men doing the same thing right. is just too big. So there's a few things and um, I want to spin off of what you were saying around the youth. Since you started this as a brainstorming and I love that concept, <coughs> I'm sorry. One of the things that um, I think we do uh, if we say this role in manufacturing, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I would traditionally have a role in manufacturing. 
or if you're uh, a physicist or a, sci um, a chemist, you're going to work in one specific role. What about the idea of brainstorming around capability and capacity, but something non-traditional? Do I have to be a mechanical engineer to have a manufacturing role? Do I have to um, be a traditional PhD in one particular area to have a certain role? If we start to open up the, the types of degrees or the background and the training that we can have in certain roles, then there is a way for us to take and to have these different roles without having the, the stringent background of what they used to be. You know, it, it, it just used to be very specific this type of background, this type of job. How different are we willing to play in, in any of our spaces? How different will we play in the private sector um, for some of the roles that we hire for? And, ha and how creative or, or flexible are we willing to be to say, uh, this technologist uh, has brilliance and um, you know, greatness and we can train them in some of the other areas that they didn't necessarily do if that's the type of role they want to do. So the first thing is, are we willing to look at things a little bit differently and right. do them? So that's, that's one of the areas. The, um, in terms of um, the pay gap, I mean, now that is certainly something that I, I believe we see everywhere, yeah. globally. Um, and so I think that um, we, you asked about not just the pay gap, but also how can we solve some of the localization issues? And they go hand in hand to me because uh, we can't have uh, people or technologists working and solving problems if we're, we can't even keep them in the roles because we're not paying them. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I've seen uh, done very well, um, not just in the US, but also in India. So here I'll give some global examples. <laughs> We've done, um, there was a partnership that's hosted by uh, USAID and, um, the, this is specifically around healthcare because that's my area um, where I used to work. And uh, we were doing, um, I served as a judge on these, uh, on these panels where they would have scientists or technologists or big ideas. Uh, they would be, have an opportunity to present their ideas, to work in collaboration with the private sector, with research, with the government, depending on um, if your, your project was selected. So maybe um, your idea, your technology, your localized solution won the award. And the, the prize was, in our case, we hosted the winning scientists at our research center in India. And they were allowed the opportunity to have a mentor, a scientist at our GE Research Center in Bangalore. This was an India-based uh, project where they worked uh, a certain number of hours that we gifted as a part of this prize. Working in our labs, working uh, side by side with a very advanced technologist that was going to help take this local solution yes. and bring it to, to bear. I think that um, that was a great opportunity for us to one, collaborate, to work closely with the government um, as a private sector entity and say that uh, this is important to India and therefore, even though it's not an area that we're focused on specifically, we want to use our expertise to help advance it. And then I also think it was a really um, great engagement between the Science Institutes and USAID. You know, I think that that's something we, could, we should brainstorm with CSIR about and we should say, how do we, how do we make that happen again? And by and we, I mean various organizations. We've Sorry. got two days of conferences that's right. to do exactly that. So let's hope those are the kind of conversations we do get into. Unfortunately, we have a run out of time and we are going to get into some closing comments now um, from Imran. I mean, we're here for the next two days. What are you hoping uh, the, uh, the, the CSI conference will achieve? Your closing comments. Uh, closing comments. Uh, I mean, in terms of this, the CSR is is a DSD institution. So this is a is a, a important platform for uh, people to learn more about the CSR. So one of the things we're hoping through broadcasts like this, etc., that people will see the rich capabilities and capacities that exist in the CSR, the many exciting work that are being done in order to provide your, your, your viewership with opportunities to, to approach the CSR for what we've been talking about. We need to approach this as a, as a partnership. So I think that's the first that we're hoping uh, over the next two days. And I'm hoping, secondly, out of these two days of engagement that people will use the opportunities to to continue a discussion about how we can work a lot more closer together. The South Africa incorporated approach is important. Can we, can we be 
flexible enough to, 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 to think about things that are in our collective interest. And with that, I, I would want to highlight just what people have, have highlighted earlier around, around youth as an example. Those are not problems. They can be seen as opportunities. Recently, we had a, a, a similar broadcast with CNBC, and we said that one of the areas that we can become world leaders in is in the area of education technologies, because we, we can think about how you use uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, other means to kind of address the backlogs that we have because and those areas are And you don't really need maths and science, yes. and many people will say, but Janine, I'm gonna come to you and we are running out of time, so I would ask that we just have briefer closing comments. Engagement and collaboration, two themes that have come up yes. strongly, but for you? For me, over the next two days, to really see how we take the innovation and the great ideas that I've seen as I've walked through the um, the lobbies here and seen some of the setups, and how do we help ensure that those those innovations and ideas get to the next level? And how are we just hearing and learning uh, some of the opportunities for engagement, but taking it to the next next phase, taking these brainstorming ideas and figuring out what's an outcome that we can check back in the next six to twelve months and say we've done it differently. I'd love to see us unpack and demystify the implications of Industry 4.0 on manufacturing. We need to be realistic about understanding where the threats lie, but also we need to be uh, we, we need to identify where the opportunities are so that we can um, improve our manufacturing sector, increase growth and jobs as well. So. Thanks. In addition to what's already been said, I think to tackle some of the um, hard questions and start having conversations around where we're taking the issues of youth and innovation, uh, <coughs> but also around inequality and addressing inequality yes. and the role of innovation and technologies in starting to address some very deep <coughs> fundamental problems in our country. Yes, definitely. I think all the good things have been said, um, and perhaps from a CSR perspective, what one hopes to achieve from this is to have better interaction with the private sector. I think we work very closely with government, but not enough in terms of our interaction with the private sector. And I understand that there are a number of private sector individuals that are here. I mean, we've got General Electric right there with us in the manufacturing circle. But Zulani, we're going to leave it on that note. And to the panelists, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time and your engagement, key themes that came out. To the audience, thanks so much for your collaboration and your time. That is where we're going to leave it for the CNBC Africa special. From myself, Evie Peters, it's bye for now. <laughs>